So let's and set the scene. We're, we're in the, the 1960s. Mm-hmm. We have right. Jerome Cavanaugh, who's the yep. Kennedy-like mayor of, of Detroit, exactly. elected full of bright hopes for Detroit's future. Right. He gets slammed by suburbanization, which is abetted by those automobiles that Detroit itself mm-hmm. makes and the rise of a highway system that makes it easier to drive in and out. He gets slammed by a certain amount of industrial relocation, right? the right. move to lower cost locations, the move to right to work states uh, yeah. in the South, Southern for, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, what happens? And, and how, does he, how does he respond? How does, how does the city respond? He uh, mounted a bid for the Olympics for Detroit, and Detroit won as the American entry, mm-hmm. which seems impossible. But that was his great dream, and he he was one of those, I'm going to say, really great mayors. Who his he, he really felt the city was his, and it was his job to make it work and make everybody belong and change things. He hired a, a new police chief who wasn't seen as the enemy of the black mm-hmm. people and things of that nature. Then the riots happened. It was a 1967. Sun- right? 1967, early in the morning. And so you got up on a Sunday morning in, in, in July, and for me there was kind of a question, are we going to church or not? Because you want to put on that hot suit or this is July. And, and suddenly there were, we went out on your stoop and there was something going on down the street. Couldn't quite tell what it was. But of course as neighborhood kids you had to go see. But before you could get down there, these strange things would be happening where, you know, people walking with two lamps in their hand and, and, and uh, dry cleaning, other people's dry cleaning, and, <laughs> and, and it was so strange. And suddenly it emerged that, you know, this is a commotion of a type we've never seen. And very quickly a thing had to happen. You had to know whether you were from a family where you could bring these stolen things or no. Well, luckily, I, I was real clear at my house. Was <laughs> you weren't bringing any stolen goods home yet. Yeah. But, it, but it got so bizarre that as this went on, things like pianos would roll down your street. It was just, it was out of body. Right. Yeah. But this inspired in white people in even close suburbs, because I've read these stories. There's many short stories on Detroit I got to enjoy about how, where people were, and if their daughter was a sales clerk at Hudson's or something like that, how they got to drive in. And this was, then, then this, the main commercial areas, particularly 12th Street, which is now Rosa Park, they got set afire. And there was this question, well, wh- who would burn down the stores? But this, had, I tell you, race was always in the background. Well, all those stores were owned by white people. And apparently they didn't gain the love of their customers, particularly. <laughs> Uh, and even the black store owners, they thought, well, you know, they put Soul Brother in the window and that would, it didn't quite work that way. So this, it was. It's pandemonium. It was quite that. Yeah. It, was, it was indescribable, but very real. And then you drove downtown and here are tanks strolling down. There were anti-aircraft guns. The only thing they could have shot was the top of the GM building. I mean, <laughs> well, these were sent in by Governor Romney, right? With, right. The, uh, uh, well, it was a big thing yeah. between Romney and 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 the president. Well, I think the president was Johnson. Yes, who, Trump. Who? who it, it, there were several big questions, like the insurance question, because if it's a real riot rebellion, you're not covered. But if you're something else, it is covered. Mm-hmm. So they they had that back and forth. The tanks came. And the, the number of people who were killed was was ex- exponential. Forty-two. Yes, and and the number of them who were white was the small number. The blacks really were killed a lot, as well as injured, and the number of people arrested is a, the, the thousands. But in the neighborhoods like mine, with the commercial center on 12th Street. I don't know where the black people got the guns and rifles, but there was a lot of snipers on roofs, and and it was just incredible. And you had, I mean, what you had in Detroit, as Ken was explaining, is you had a very significant black middle class, uh, but you also had a very poor black population. And I think the gap in wealth within the black community and then between whites and blacks was so great that that kind of helped fuel this. You know, we've worked hard, we're working hard, but we're not getting ahead like some of the other people. I mean, Detroit is so wealthy, and yet people are still not doing well. Poverty is still very high. And I think on a hot day, 
the, the police raid on this blind pig, very much like the raid on the Gotham Hotel mm -hmm. a little earlier, just let all that frustration out. And people went crazy. Uh, I'm not saying that. I'm saying people in the black community yeah, told yeah. me, we, people yeah. went crazy. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, it also was the beginning of the great, great escape from Detroit, which between the escape of whites, followed later, a decade later, by the escape of middle class blacks, left tremendous income segregation in the city. And then, once the auto industry begins to collapse, with foreign imports uh, stealing more and more of the consumer dollar, taking more and more of the consumer dollar, uh, you have massive layoffs, and that poverty amidst plenty becomes so obvious.